Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims. I'm the executive director here at the Institute of Politics. We are really honored today to welcome Caroline Kennedy, former US ambassador to Japan, and I should note, honorary chair and tireless champion of Harvard's Institute of Politics, which we here are indebted to for giving inspiration and partnership to this Institute of Politics. We look forward to her conversation with a fellow amb former ambassador, Evo Dalder. I want to mention a few upcoming events. Continuing our ambassadorial focus, tomorrow at 5, we will have former US ambassador to Russia, William Burns, who will be discussing his new book on American diplomacy with Samantha Vinograd of CNN. Thursday, the Washington Post's Jason Rezaian will be recording a live episode of The Axe Files with David Axelrod. Next Tuesday, former US Secu Secretary of Homeland Security will be visiting um, to discuss her new book on security policy since 9-11, Janet Napolitano. You can find out more about all of our upcoming events at politics.uchicago.edu. We will have questions at the end of this event. Um, please line up behind the microphone in the aisle. As usual, we will give priority for the first three questions to students, and we would love to see questions from young women and young men. I am sure there will be many today, and so I ask you to please keep them brief so we can get through as many as possible. Last, please make sure that your phones are on silent and restrooms are down the hall if you need them. Here to formally introduce our speaker is Lucy Ritzman. Lucy is a second year student from um, New York who is studying law, letters, and society and history. This year she is the speaker series content intern at the IOP, and she is also a senior writer for The Gate. Please join me in welcoming her. It is my privilege today to introduce former Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, an author, editor, attorney, activist, and diplomat. She was appointed by President Barack Obama to, the, to be the US Ambassador to Japan, the first woman to be appointed to that role, and she served there from 2013 to 2017. Prior to that, she was the Vice Chair of the Fund for Public Schools in New York City. Under her leadership, the fund engaged a record number of volunteers and helped to create the first K-12 arts curriculum funded by the private sector. Ambassador Kennedy has also edited 11 New York Times best-selling works. In the course of her extraordinary career, Ambassador Kennedy has worn many hats, and in each role she has worked to create important discourse and to benefit people in this country and in others. She is a role model, especially to young women like myself at the very beginning of our careers, as she exemplifies the practice of working hard to do good work. I look forward to hearing her highly informed insight on public service and the U.S.'s current diplomatic challenges. Today's conversation will be moderated by Evo H. Dalder, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO and current president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Prior to his appointment as an ambassador to NATO, Ambassador Dalder was a senior fellow in foreign policy studies at the Brookings Institution. Please join me in welcoming Ambassadors Evo Dalder and Caroline Kennedy. Well, it's wonderful to be here in a full room. This is amazing. On a, I guess it's raining outside. Like I'm at Hogwarts here. This is really great. It is. There's the, uh, the sorting chairs at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's great, great to have you in, in Chicago. Great to have an opportunity to have a conversation about the art of diplomacy. Uh, and, and I know there are going to be lots of questions out there in the audience, but uh, let's, let's start for a few minutes just to talk a little bit about your your time in Japan and what it meant to be an ambassador. And let me start with a question I could ask myself, but I'm going to ask you, which is as a political ambassador, somebody who was appointed by the president uh, but not part of the diplomatic service, uh, never served in that sort of capacity, um, going to a country which is probably one of, one of the, if not the most important bilateral relationship we have, uh, Japan, how did you prepare for that job? How did you prepare, not just in your lifetime, but the, when you knew, once you knew this was happening, what, what did you do to get ready uh, to take on this huge and humongous challenge of re representing the United States and Japan? Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for coming, and um, it's great to be here. Uh, I work closely with the Institute of Politics at Harvard, and um, I really admire uh, the Institute of Politics here. And, 
and, um, and you're making us better at what we do, and you're so lucky to have the talent that you have here. But in answer to the question, I would say that, um, especially for political uh, appointees, the State Department um, is very, very patient with us, and, um, and they take it very seriously to prepare us as well as they possibly can. So I had uh, a great deal of support um, uh, from the State Department in terms of briefings. Uh, one of the things that really interested me, actually, though, was that once you're nominated, you're not allowed to uh, meet publicly or really technically meet at all with anyone who knows anything about your country that you're going to. So um, it kind of makes no sense, but um, it, somehow the system manages to work pretty well. Uh, and the idea behind that is that you are not supposed to look like you are uh, assuming that you're going to be confirmed, um, because that might infringe upon the prerogative of the Senate. But um, nevertheless, in-house, there's a tremendous uh, amount of knowledge, skill, uh, and resources within the State Department, and everybody is extremely generous with their uh, expertise. So before you went out there, did you have a clear sense of what the key priorities were that you were going to take in your three to four years you were going to spend? Uh, or were you going to listen and learn? Was it all learn? up to me? Yeah, uh, well. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and how did you set those priorities? Uh, well, I think that um, uh, people asked that question at the beginning, and I really felt like, um, well, uh, hopefully somebody else has set the priorities. Um, before I show up, but nevertheless, I think that as an ambassador, you do have a lot of um, freedom and, and a great deal of trust and responsibility is placed on you to uh, not only to um, initiate um, things, and, um, but also to report back on the priorities that you've been given and how they're working and whether they need to be adjusted, um, because you're really the person on the ground in the host country. So. Um, but I think in my case, there was President Obama had um, put a great deal of emphasis on the rebalance to Asia. Uh, it's really um, where our future is going to be determined, and Japan is our closest ally in the region. And uh, so it was a tremendous. It is and was um, and has been for many years, uh, as you said, or as Mike Mansfield used to say, there is no more important bilateral relationship. You can't say it's the most important. But, um, and so I think that I was certainly aware of that every day. But I think that um, I didn't realize until I got there, but I think choosing me had uh, a great deal of resonance in Japan uh, in a way that allowed us to further our priorities, both being the first uh, child of a Pacific War veteran, um, and the 70th anniversary of the end of the war happened when I was in Japan um, and culminated with President Obama's visit to Hiroshima and Prime Minister Abe's visit to Pearl Harbor, both of which were the first by a sitting leader um, from our respective countries. And also, I think that um, the uh, women's equality, advancement, empowerment, um, was is a priority for President Obama, and it was increasingly a priority for Prime Minister Abe, even though we were starting from somewhat different places. So being the first woman also, I think, showed the US commitment to uh, Japanese women, uh, as well as um, the full range of our other ongoing issues that we deal with, economic, security, um, people to people, sort of full array of diplomacy. So I want to come back to some of those specific issues, including this really historic visit that the President made to Hiroshima. And you'd been there before, uh, only I think as the second uh, uh, US ambassador to visit uh, Hiroshima. Um, but b before we get to some of those specifics, which I think is, are, are important, including the trade and the security relationship, um, you walked into the embassy. You, uh, you got off the airplane. You walk into the embassy. You now are in charge of 1,000, 2,000 people. It's a big mission. Uh, you are the senior most important US person in, in the country. Everybody will look at you as the direct representative, not only of the United States, but of President Obama in particular. Um, what, did, what was the, cha the biggest challenge you faced starting off uh, in, that, in, in that moment? Did you have a big challenge? Did you see something that you had to, to overcome? And how did you overcome it? 
Uh, well, I think that there was a lot of, um, people would phrase it, when I sat down with the press, it was uh, Mike Mansfield, Walter Mondale, Howard Baker, um, Tom Foley. Ed Roshauer, Tom Foley. How does that make you feel? <laughs> um, so, you know, I said, like a woman? I don't know. Um, so I think there was, a, you know, uh, some s skepticism about my appointment and my lack of experience. Um, but I think that I really felt that um, representing my family legacy, uh, President Kennedy's values, uh, kind of all my life, in a sense, um, as well as working closely with President Obama on his campaigns, and um, had prepared me much better than people realized um, for this particular job. And um, President Kennedy's memory in Japan, uh, the, the depth of affection and admiration for him was something that I hadn't really been as aware of. Um, I sort of would have expected it in Germany or France. Um, but I think that Japan really came of age in the early 60s and re-entered the world stage in a sense. They recovered from the war, and he was the first president that, um, that they really responded to. Um, and so I think that there was a tremendous, I had a, just an amazing opportunity to connect with people uh, in a way that um, in a very formal society, a very reserved diplomatic setting, I, I think people don't usually have. And I, I felt that um, I wanted to help everyone in the embassy do their job. That was really what I saw as my job. Um, but I also felt that I had really unique personal opportunity to connect with the broader public. And it was um, Ambassador Nick Burns who had really encouraged me to really take that on as my responsibility in a way that other ambassadors maybe who weren't as well known or as easy to connect to um, wouldn't really have the ability to do that um, right from the start. So you talked about the formality of Japanese society and there's the informality of our society. Uh, how did you break through? I mean, you did some pretty interesting ways of being a little different than, than uh, some of those ambassadors you mentioned. You jogged in the... <laughs> Uh, under the cherry blossoms uh, and, and, and other ways in order to sort of connect with people on a, on a more direct basis uh, and, and sell the United States and what it is in a more people-to-people, -people, society to society, while still, of course, doing the formal policy ways. What were sort of the, the best ways in which you were able to, to get into uh, the society, to meet with people, to connect with people, to connect, make the connection between the folks in the United States and in Japan? Um, Huh? How, how do you make that work? Because it's an essential part of right. being an ambassador. Right. Um, well, it's just, I was just so fascinated by everything about Japan. And there were things that I had worked on here, whether it was education or the books I had done on poetry, uh, that I felt were natural <clears throat> openings for me. I mean, Japan has obviously uh, thousands of years poetic tradition, and it was something that I wanted to learn about. It's hard when you don't speak the language, but. Um, they have contests, they have, you know, obviously haiku and all kinds of things. So I, I really made an effort to sort of follow down uh, avenues that, that were of personal interest to me because I think people can tell when you're personally interested in something. Um, I didn't get as many golf invitations as my predecessors. <laughs> I didn't get as many all-night drinking invitations as my predecessors, but, um, you know, I made up for it with... Um, haiku and bike rides and uh, <laughs> things like that. So, um, so I, I felt like it was OK to take a break from golf and drinking for, for the US for a while. But the Red Sox won the World Series right when I got there, uh, right before I got there. And they had two Japanese players. Right. Um, so I think that there are just so many, many ways. And one of the things that struck me, and I hope if there are students here, you will consider uh, you know, a career in the Foreign Service or certainly explore some sort of um, international work because um, I think it really teaches you so much about the United States when you're abroad and, um, and also how uh, deep these relationships are that are, you know, not, that are people to people and how important that is. So I tried to really uh, work on that because there are sort of generations had worked on it before and certainly coming 
um, having the war anniversary was another way of doing that because so much of our shared history and so many of the relationships that were formed uh, began in that post-war period. And families, children, grandchildren have grown up with that bilateral relationship in a way that I, um, that I didn't see as often when I was here, but it's certainly you see it every day there. What, what did you learn about the United States while you were there? Um, I learned that we are um, the indispensable nation still, uh, that, every, that there are uh, countries around the world look to us for uh, leadership, moral leadership, um, that Japan, but that they have increasing concerns about our reliability and um, as an ally. And I think that, um, I don't know if, if you found that in Europe, um, so I would love to hear your sense of that too. I think Japan is our most loyal ally and obviously depends on us for their uh, security. So we're very secure there, but I think that they too have concerns as we move forward uh, in this period. And I could get really specific, but I'm not gonna do that right this <laughs> second. I'm gonna build up to that. <laughs> but I'd, I'd love to hear your well, so take to, uh, of America. Uh, I mean, when I was I was in Japan about two months, two years, two years ago, um, uh, doing an interview for for a book and talked to a senior Japanese diplomat who had the best and most chilling, actually, observation. He says the throne is empty when it came to uh, thinking about the indispensable power. Uh, and the good news was, he said, I think we can manage for the next three right. years. That's right. I just don't know if we can manage for eight. Um, <laughs> That's as far as I'll go on the politics, too. <laughs> uh, for many Europeans, by the way, the throne has been empty for a while, and they're very worried about who's going to sit in it next, as I think the Japanese are as well. Um, some, some specific issues that, that you face. Okinawa. It's a, uh, uh, we've been trying to, to move a base uh, in Okinawa. We have 50,000 Marines uh, in, in there. There is this extraordinarily strong security and defense relationship we have with, with uh, Japan. The Japanese understand the importance of a continuing relationship. And yet, this is a, a real sore in, in, uh, in the domestic politics of Japan and in some ways in the relationship. How did you deal with that? You went to Okinawa, but, but how did you deal with that issue uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a real issue in the, in the bilateral relationship that's we don't realize how important it right. is here, but it is very important very, very in Japan. Very important there. Uh, well, um, Vice President Mondale, uh, and, you know, in particular, um, spoke to me a lot about it before I went. Um, he had been ambassador when there had been a really um, terrible incident involving U.S. servicemen, and a, um, and. Every few years, there is one. There was one um, toward the end of my tenure. So I was fortunate that it came toward the end. Um, and I had strong relationships built up with the government. Um, but um, I was really impressed with how seriously the US military takes their uh, responsibility as to be good neighbors, to be good citizens. Um, but um, there are policies. I, I think they could do more. I think they could do, we could do a lot more um, to be better at that. But, um, but of course, there are mostly great people. Um, and then every so often, this was a military contractor in my time that um, raped and murdered a Japanese woman. And so it just so happened to uh, break into the news the day before President Obama was supposed to land. And so um, it was a huge crisis for the Japanese government. Um, and became one for him, for, for us as well. And, um, and it was just the latest in a series of, of incidents like this which have made the Okinawan people have a very tense relationship both with us and with the Japanese government. And they have um, the anti-base uh, protests have grown stronger in recent years, although the Japanese government believes that the younger generation is uh, less anti-base uh, than the others. But I think what most Americans don't realize is that this is the site of the only land battle in Japan in the war in which a third of the population was killed, and we occupied Okinawa until the 70s. 
So I think that they, the older generation really lived through American occupation. And, um, and so that's a really different kind of experience than most base hosting communities. And so um, we still have 50,000 um, Marines there and many others coming through all the time. So it's a, an important factor in the local economy, but it's also, um, we still have a lot of the best land. We have over 20 bases on Okinawa. So it's, it's a significant uh, and incredibly important um, strategic location. So, so it's complicated. Um, it's very complicated, and, uh, and it really affects our, all of our relationship. But I, we were, I think, as a result of a real effort um, and a need to show some, to create some positive momentum in that dynamic, uh, able to um, work with the Japanese government to give back the largest piece of land since we gave back all of Okinawa in the 70s, which was a, a pristine jungle, a jungle warfare training center in 10,000 acres in, uh, that we just have been holding on to. So, um, but we didn't really, we were able to use, to continue our training um, without that. And the Japanese government has been working on relocating this base. and. Um, the Pentagon is very frustrated by the pace of the delay, and the Japanese are very frustrated that we are frustrated, and so it's a really bad um, dynamic um, from time to time. But it, it seems, you know, it seems to be moving forward, and um, we'll see what happens. But they have also done a number of other things that we wanted uh, very much um, in the meantime. So I think it's just a comp. A, a really interesting part of the relationship, and it takes constant work. And uh, everybody's using everybody else for their own political gain, so it's difficult. Talk about another difficult issue. You mentioned President Obama's visit to Hiroshima, President, uh, Prime Minister Abe's visit to Pearl Harbor. How did that come about? This was 2016, if I remember right. right. Um, where, where, where did that idea come from of an exchange of visits? Um, and, and how did you, as the person who had to manage that relationship on the ground, uh, help bring this about? Because it was a historic decision, which was not easy for either, I think, either uh, leader to take. Uh, though, I think, in the retrospect, probably the right thing. Right. To well, do. to me, it seemed um, amazing that it had never happened. And it certainly had been an idea that had been raised over the last 70 years, but had always been turned down. So, um, so I think that while in hindsight it seems somewhat inevitable, um, there were obviously reasons why it had never happened. And I think that those reasons had, um, uh, there was great domestic opposition on, on both sides, and um, from time to time it was stronger, or, uh, and I think it has obviously ebbed somewhat. Um, enough, uh, but I think President Obama was really committed to uh, nonproliferation and disarmament as part of his both Senate career and presidency, uh, and then personally, um, I think, um, sort of saw it as an opportunity to demonstrate um, reconciliation and to celebrate the strength of the alliance that has come uh, kind of out of the ashes of war. So I think that it was something that he uh, probably wanted to do, but it was almost the end of his second term by the time he did it. And, um, and even though it seems inevitable, I think it was high stakes. It was the middle of a presidential campaign. Uh, and I think in the past, whenever this idea had been floated, there was a, a lot of opposition, um, perhaps from veterans communities, from the military, uh, because it was always um, set out that the Japanese were going to require an apology. And for the U.S., that's a non-starter. Um, so, uh, so how do you bridge that? And um, for Prime Minister Abe, I think it was very uh, high risk because um, he has a strong nationalist base, but also because if this didn't go well, um, he it was so important to Japan and Japanese history, and such an would be such an iconic moment that he easily could have lost his position. And so. Uh, so it wasn't that anybody was really against it. It was just that everything about it was um, incredibly high 
risk or high stakes. And so everybody cared about every single detail. But uh, slowly, I think that um, as um, because I think there was a good working relationship at all levels, um, we were a, the president did come. And, um, and he came just uh, as part of the G7 uh, meeting. He came on the tail end of that. So, um, so I think that it's just one of those times where everything fell into place um, in a way that um, you couldn't have uh, orchestrated better. But I think that the outpouring afterwards was something that was so unbelievably emotional in Japan and so incredibly important to them that, that this had happened that I think it really um, is one of the reasons why um, they'll be able to manage with an empty throne for a few more years. Um, just that, you know, that, that effort that he made to show that the United States, um, you know, that he was willing to go there, I think was tremendously significant. Raise another issue that has been a key topic between the U.S. and Japan for a long time, trade. Right. Uh, President, Maybe you've uh, heard about it lately. Yeah. <laughs> well, P President yeah. Trump, I think, in the White House, in, in the meeting with Prime Minister Abe just on Friday, said that they're going to have a fantastic trade agreement, going to be done by the end of the month. <laughs> By end of May, uh, they're going to reduce their agricultural tariffs because that's so easy for the Japanese right. <laughs> to do. Um, you actually were part of a time when we did negotiate a very significant trade agreement, uh, which very significantly reduced agricultural tariffs for the first time with the Japanese, called the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Um, talk a little bit about the Japanese attitude towards trade, how difficult it was to get that agreement, which for those of you who don't know, the president walked out of the third day in his, uh, when he was in office, uh, that's the current president, um, uh, TPP. Uh, but that was the bilateral, that was the trade agreement we had with Japan, and it was uh, a big one. Right. Uh, and it was a big achievement of, uh, of President Obama, even he, though he wasn't able to get it ratified. Right. Uh, well, trade agreements are always really tough, and, and so seeing that up process up close um, uh, was showed me how difficult it really was. But I think the really significant um, elements of TPP, and maybe people have read about it now, were that it was a 12-nation agreement um, and that included um, all the countries on the Pacific Rim, on um, you know, South America, Asia, um, and the US, and Canada, and Mexico. So, um, so it was incredibly important strategically uh, in terms of our ability to set the rules of trade for the 21st century and include digital trade, include labor and environmental protections, um, as well as um, kind of each country making real concessions. But they did that because they were, um, it was really a package, um, a comprehensive package of trading between 12 different countries and economies. And so the Japanese had always been the prize for these kinds of agreements, and they had never really um, been willing to open up their markets, especially in agriculture. Um, so this was really a significant um, uh, agreement because they did that for the first time. And um, so President Trump uh, withdrew, but um, and the Japanese, I think, uh, interestingly enough, convinced the other 11 countries to stay in the deal. Uh, and so um, it isn't obviously as meaningful without the United States, um, but I think that um, they were hoping that we would come back. So we haven't, and now we are um, badgering them to make a trade agreement with us. And <laughs> they're looking at us. Um, you know, uh, so they're refusing to give us any more than they gave in TPP because those were huge concessions for them, and the prime minister is facing an election this summer. Um, but I think that it it would have it has had or will have um, real strategic consequences that are not to our benefit, even if eventually they do make a bilateral trade deal with the U.S. And the only reason that they will is because. President Trump is threatening auto tariffs on them, and that is something that is uh, probably equally important in their economy. So even though they're producing more cars here, um, and they're willing to open up their car market to US cars, I don't think they think they have that much to fear. Um, but um, probably shouldn't say that, but anyway. Um, I'm sure they, you didn't say that when I you were in say, Japan. I no. didn't say that when I was in Japan. Um, Anyway, that's preferable to them. But agriculture is a really difficult 
area for them, and they went. They did make significant concessions, and I think that they. Um, and now, um, all the other TPP countries are getting the benefit of of what we negotiated and uh, taking away all kinds of market share from U.S. companies in Japan. So, not only was it strategically a blunder, but we're our, economically we're suffering from it too. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but hopefully the president has something I haven't thought of up his sleeve. <laughs> we're going to open it up in questions for one minute. I'll have one, uh, so I think we, you line up over there in the first three questions. In fact, hopefully more than the first three questions are by students. So if you have a question, uh, please start lining up at the, uh, at the microphone. Uh, you lived in a country uh, that uh, saw missiles flying over it from the guy we now love, Kim Jong-un, <laughs> uh, but at the time was Little, little Rocket Man, uh, before he was Little Rocket yeah, Man, Yeah, before I guess. he was Little Rocket Man. Um, I mean, Japan is living that right. close. It's, it's, it's almost as close as South Korea, but it is as close, it, it's, it's that close to a nuclear threat that is very real. Um, how, uh, uh, how, one, how did they experience it, and two, what are they hoping from the, what are they looking for from the United States? Uh, to deal with that, uh, that threat uh, from North Korea, nuclear and missiles? Uh, um, well, it's, it's, it's use first of all, um, anything to do with nuclear weapons, obviously in Japan, has just a tremendous uh, resonance and um, is a traumatic history. So, um, so that is another layer that I, um, not only that, they're, um, they're in a really dangerous neighborhood. Their neighbors are North Korea, China, Russia, um, and uh, two of which are the biggest, you know, in the State Department they always say for the U.S. the biggest long-term threat is China, and the biggest short-term threat is North Korea. Well, those are Japan's neighbors, and they're our closest ally. And any, any conflict that was to happen in Asia, they would be the number one target because all of our bases are there um, as well. And so, um, this is an existential issue for them, um, whereas to us it's important, and, um, but it, I don't think it's um, a daily fear. And um, so the stakes are really high, and they um, obviously are laser focused on uh, the North Korea threat, and um, I think that they, are, uh, they were very concerned that um, the president would sort of make a deal that protected the U.S. but left Japan exposed. And so um, they were quite relieved when uh, that wasn't done. Um, but I think that they, um, they are still incredibly nervous about what um, might happen. Um, and the other thing that has happened, though, I think that we uh, didn't anticipate is that they, um, their relations even the Japanese relations with China are improving mm -hmm. as a result of um, the concerns about this administration and its policies and reliability. And so I think that they had, um, Prime Minister Abe has been able to improve his relations with China, which is something that um, nobody really thought was gonna happen too soon, uh, as well as um, with Russia as a result of some of President Trump's actions. So the whole dynamic is changing, um, even though the fundamentals are still um, the same. The other thing that, ha that it's makes it difficult is that Japan and Korea historically have a difficult uh, history, and, um, but they're our two closest allies. So President Obama put a lot of work into uh, trying to bring them closer, information sharing, military cooperation, uh, all of that, and that, I think, has hasn't had the same degree of attention. So um, those two countries are estranged, which is not only unfortunate for them, but uh, for us as well, it makes us less secure. We'll go to the questions now. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for that. And well, the first question, if you can let us know who you are. Uh, yes, hi, um, my name is Devin Wenzel and I am a first year English major in the college. And I guess I just wanna start off by saying how, what is an honor to like ask you a question, but like, <laughs> It has nothing to do with politics, and you might just go like, 
Oh no. But um, <laughs> but um, so I'm I'm a, as an English major, I'm just like a huge uh, book and TV nerd, and I like to always ask really accomplished and cool people if they have like any recommendations for like any books or like what TV that you really like. So I will take anything and everything. <laughs> uh, well. Um, this is going to sound really nerdy, but I got really interested in reading Japanese um, novels uh, in translation, obviously. And um, so there are incredible um, novels that, um, that I, whether it's uh, Murakami or um, the older ones like um, OA, that really talk about these historical issues in an interesting way. And um, even Pachinko, which is uh, about Koreans in Japan. Um, but I, I guess um, just in terms of what I've, uh, I don't know, all-time favorites? Anything. You know, I, uh, uh, Middle March, because people were talking about it. And recently I read, even though I'm a few years behind, Just Mercy, which is really, uh, or sl and Slavery by Another Name, which are really incredible books on the U.S., any good, any good TV shows? I don't watch a lot of TV. You know why? Because when I was in Japan, the only thing I could get was Armed Forces Network. And, um, it's all sports. All it's sports, it's all, all sports. It's all sports, and it's all um, ads about um, cyber identity theft. Identity theft. And so I, I kind of gave up after a while. So, And I don't know, that habit, just like I gave up cranberry juice and cottage cheese, which are two of my favorite things, and I haven't resumed since I came home, so. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, I had a question. The world is becoming increasingly globalized, and concepts like border and even nation are changing and are highly contentious. What do you think the role of an ambassador is in the coming future? Concepts like what? The concept of border or oh, nation. Border. Okay. Um, well, I would like to hear... Um, Ambassador Dalder's answer, but I, I guess I would say that um, people think the role of an ambassador, especially to an ally, is maybe just ceremonial and really not that, there's not that much to it. Um, it's a lot of socializing. Um, actually, I thought that, um, so I hadn't really ever been, <laughs> I was hoping, no. I, um, I wasn't really that originally interested, but because it was Japan, I was completely excited about the idea. But, um, but I think there is a lot more work um, there. And um, now that we don't have ambassadors in so many places, I think that you can really see the value that ambassadors add. Because for the host country, it's a real sign of respect and a real ability to get themselves heard in Washington. They have their own ambassador in Washington, but um, if, as a US ambassador, you go back to the White House, to the State Department, and explain why something is either a good or bad idea, um, it's tremendously valuable to them, and then therefore you're able to advocate more successfully for US interests. So I think that diplomacy certainly is changing, and um, when I would hear about how people went about it in the 50s in Japan, it has just blown my mind in terms of like, they quit every day at two, they played golf, they had a party. The, I mean, the whole thing just sounds wild. But um, there's a lot of work. There are 17 US government agencies represented at the US mission in Tokyo. And so that just gives you a sense of how deep and broad the alliance is, for example. Um, but how many, when you say the world is becoming globalized, how globalized, um, the U.S. government is because it has people on the ground in countries around the world that I think agriculture, FBI, um, DHS, all of that is, there are people, commerce in Japan, which I think a lot of people don't really realize. I don't know, what do you say? No, I, I, I think that's, that's all very true. I mean, one of the greatest secretaries of state, George Shultz, said diplomacy is like gardening. And you gotta be there to take the weeds out and make sure that the flowers start to bloom in time. And you have to be in the country to understand the country, to be part of it uh, in, its, in, its, in its depth. And, and the, the idea that somehow you can base relationships between countries on who can tweet the fastest, uh, rather than spending time learning 
uh, what it is like, what the real interests are in, in the countries that you are dealing with when you're negotiating. You, it's not good enough to say, I know how to deal with these things. Uh, you Actually, you don't until you have this sense of, uh, of what happens. And an ambassador is just part, is just a leader of the large US presence there uh, and has particular access both back to Washington and, and to the leadership in the country. But it's the entire presence of the US government uh, and then I think, as you said, the showing by, by Washington, by sending an ambassador, sending somebody like you to Japan, that we care about you. We care about you as a country, as an ally. Uh, or, in fact, we care about you when you're not a, uh, an ally. Uh, so we spent very important people to China to just make sure that the relationship uh, can evolve uh, in a way that is beyond where we are today. And we see that the damage that we have of not having an ambassador in most of the Middle Eastern countries. We have no ambassador in Egypt. We have no ambassador in Turkey. Until a few weeks ago, we had no ambassador in Saudi Arabia. Um, and how can you have a relationship with countries when you don't have that fundamental presidential representative to the right. country? So it's important. Thanks. Great country. Great, great question. Next. Next. Um, Hi, my name is Matt. I'm a first year in the medical school here. And I was wondering what you see as a way forward for the US in trying to reduce tensions between Japan and China in the South China Sea. Or the East China Sea. Right, <laughs> depends who you talk to. Um, uh, well, it's really going to be, um, I mean, Japan and China are um, probably going to be the the U well, let me start that over. Um, I think the U.S. is incredibly important in that um, because, for example, President Obama, on his first official visit when I was there, so in his second term, um, squarely announced that, um, that the South China Sea, the Senkaku Islands, fell within our security treaty. Uh, and that was something that um, hadn't been articulated by a president. And so um, that really calmed things down. Um, and then, you know, every year there's like renewed activity. But I think that um, it takes U.S. Uh, involvement in these things and um, the what's going on in the within the nine dash line and all of that. That's a whole other set of challenges that um, that I think the the countries out there really want more U.S. presence um, in order to uh, preserve the status quo or to back up the smaller countries. Uh, so all those dynamics are really changing. And um, it's our role is critical. Um, between Japan and China, they will manage that relationship. It goes up and down. And um, there are economic aspects to it, uh, as well as political. And uh, right now, they're working more closely together. Um, and then uh, so I think that they'll manage those. But I think that um, without the US, um, you can't really, you're missing a huge component of being able to make those situations any better. Thanks. Great. Next question. Hi, my name is Sharon Lewis. I am a former political candidate and the director of a nonprofit startup. So first, I'd like to Thank you for being here and let you know that I'm honored to be in the room with you. So my question um, is to something you spoke to earlier. You spoke to community and cultural co cohesion and getting to know the neighbors in the country you were visiting as a matter of diplomacy. Right here at home, there is so much cultural, racial, and gender bias. What steps do you recommend that we take as an act of diplomacy here at home and with our neighbors to strengthen America here, because a stronger America is a stronger diplomacy um, abroad. Well, I think that's really the question that everybody is asking here right now, is how do we um, bridge our differences? How do we reach out um, to each other? How do we create communities that are more uh, trusting and supportive of each other and of our differences. And so um, I think that's interesting that you both pursue elective office but are also now serving and trying to work 
do that work um, outside of government um, because I do think that that people uh, want to find common ground, they want to solve problems together, and that is much more likely to happen at the local level than at the national level. But I think it's just, I was talking earlier to the Obama scholars who come from countries all over the world where they are trying to build community, and they were talking about their views of, of, of how we do things here and um, how strong our institutions and our civic life is. It's something that I don't think we always are appreciating right now that we do have a legacy to build on. But I think it's ongoing work and um, we all need to recommit ourselves to doing it every day and it's never done. So um, I would love to talk to you further and I hope that your work is, um, that, you, that you are able to see progress. I hope we all are in the next uh, few years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Evita. I'm a first year undergrad. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about any challenges you faced or things that you've learned um, as a woman in diplomacy, and then any advice that you have for other young women trying to get, become more politically active. Well, I think it's a great time for women to become politically active. So, you're here. Uh, <laughs> And um, so I hope that you will just try everything. I think the main thing to do is not to be afraid and just to keep at it um, because uh, I think it's, there's, it's, there's a lot of opportunity and there's certainly a lot of need. So um, I think that we, um, so, so I think that's uh, ongoing work. It's not always easy, but I hope that you'll just uh, work as hard as you possibly can to, to bring the kind of change because I think that I didn't even realize, but it was when I left Japan, um, how much I heard from people there about just having somebody doing this who was a woman, um, you know, was uh, empowering or helped to change some attitudes. And I, I didn't feel like, I personally didn't feel like, um, I don't know what it's like to be a man. So I didn't know what it was like to be a man ambassador or how different it was. But um, I, I just tried to do what I thought was I was sent there to do. Um, but I didn't really realize the impact that it was having in ways that I didn't appreciate. So um, not everybody, and including me, gets to be active on that scale with that much visibility throughout our whole lives. But I think that it's true in at any point in your life, no matter what scale you're operating at. Um, you do have a tremendous effect on others. And um, the example you set does affect people in ways you don't realize. So, um, so I think it's just to, do, to keep working at it and, and have the confidence uh, and not be afraid. Uh, trust yourself. Thank you. A lot of the content of Trump's campaign in 2016 was a campaign against globalization, and it seemed to have struck a, um, a responsive chord in a lot of Americans. But I wonder how much the campaign against Trump can be framed as uh, a revival of globalization and the American role. One could think of the Peace Corps under the Kennedy administration as looking at a lot of person-to-person -person, uh, activity, and so you can see opportunities in uh, transnational entrepreneurship, but how do you see uh, globalization as being represented and uh, the concrete content of that? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> so what's the answer? <laughs> Well, the reason that I want Ambassador Dalder to answer that is because um, he worked, he was ambassador to a multilateral organization. And I think that um, those took, have taken a lot of bashing in the last couple of years also. Um, but I think that one of our strengths has been the way we have worked through our alliances and through multinational, multilateral organizations. So I think that, you know, large companies, um, probably have undue power right now, and globalization needs some uh, tinkering with. But I think that, um, that we are connected, and countries are working together in ways they never did before, and these organizations are a tremendously powerful way doing that. So they need to be reinvigorated, and we need people like 
the students here to enter them and really devote yourself to building up those kinds of strengths again because um, you know people aren't going to go into government if it's just completely discredited and pe too many people are leaving. So there's going to be a huge opportunity uh, for talented, smart, globalized, well-educated people. And I think that um, we all have a responsibility to uh, kind of spend some of our time and some of our effort in uh, that kind of work to build a more peaceful world. Hi, um, everyone. My name well, is... You got off completely. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I want to be a moderator, and I want to come back in my next life as a moderator. No, no, I agree. I'll, I'll, I'll make one, one point just to re reinforce uh, on the globalization issue. One, I don't like that word. Um, I, I think the reality is we live, even as the United States, the biggest, most important country with two oceans and I think two neighbors who we like. Um, <laughs> We still live in a world that affects everything we do day in and day out. The air we breathe, the diseases that we uh, deal with and, 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 and are transmitted, the terrorism, the ideas that are all globalized in this world. And you can try to build walls as high as you want them. You can even try other people to pay for it. You can't keep the world out. And so the fundamental reality is that if you want to deal with what's happening, in the world, you need cooperation. And we are the luckiest country in the world. We're the only country in the world that has allies, really good allies. They're militarily, economically, and politically very strong. And so we should work with our allies to deal with these problems, from climate change to the distribution of wealth to uh, the future of, of agriculture in, in, in Africa so people uh, and South Asia, so there's enough food to go around for people to eat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can't do it by ourselves. We can't ignore it. And we have to do it with other people. And I think that reality is true here day in and day out. Um, it's what we all, it's why we should be part of that larger world, but we have to do it with other people as well. <laughs> the, other, the other unbelievable advantage that we have is that we have uh, diverse population from yes. all of these countries. So it's unbelievable how uh, fortunate we are as Americans when you, um, and how lucky we are that our ancestors came here, um, even though uh, obviously some of them came uh, as slaves or whatever, but in generally speaking, and um, we are very fortunate and we should take advantage of our strengths and our diversity to benefit not only ourselves, but the world. Time for one more question, or okay. uh, two more questions. Two small, two s short ones. OK, <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, yeah. My name is Angel Hines. I'm a graduate student in the evening master's program at the Harris School. And I'm also a working mom who cares a lot about the education of her children and all of our children. Um, so to that point, I, I know you've done a lot of um, work in education. I'd be curious to hear um, any lessons that you learned um, while living abroad as an ambassador that um, you would apply to education policy. Um, one of the things that I wasn't really um Education is not, is, a, is not an area that I had enough time to. I was really interested in the Japanese education system because it um, is so different from ours. Um, so I, but I spent a lot of time with students who are studying in both countries. And um, I think that obviously you know, our system could benefit from some of the things that they do well. But it's, it's, not, it's a really, really different system. It's a centralized system. And we have 18,000 school districts. So. Um, so it's not really, but I think the commitment to education there is um, impressive, but the, um, there's no ability to, there's no value on, on self-expression or your own opinion. So you really do see very, very big differences. But um, in New York, certainly, I was part of a huge education reform effort. Uh, and I think that a lot of the lessons that were learned there have proliferated a lot of the people that um, were part of that movement are all over and um, and hopefully are making some progress. But certainly, um, race and poverty are the biggest uh, barriers to education in this country. And um, 
what we've done about it is absolutely inadequate. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least. Thank you. Either right now or soon, there's a new investiture of the, <clears throat> the emperor and um, empress. And I wanted to know if you knew her. Um, <clears throat> sorry. She's um, Empress Masako. Is she, is she Empress yet? Do we know? Uh, I think that um, she's Empress or will be later today or tomorrow with the time change, but <clears throat> she isn't, they aren't being enthroned until October. Okay. Well, I wanted to know if you had a, <clears throat> a sense of her. Her dad was a diplomat, and I think she was for a while. Do you think she might make a change, a symbolic change at least, in, in Japan? Um, well, this is uh, it's actually a really interesting day to be talking about Japan because um, for the first time in 200 years, emperor has abdicated. And um, they don't allow women to become empresses. There are only three men left in the imperial family. So um, they are going to face this terrible question for them of, what would happen if, um, and princesses in the imperial family when they marry are no longer part of the family. So um, it's an unbelievably, uh, I don't know, uh, it's really hard to, to really appreciate the, the rigidity and the um, bias in the imperial system there. That said, the emperor that we just had. So it's the beginning of a new era in Japan today. So uh, they are very excited about this. It's a new young emperor and empress. She is a accomplished diplomat um, who has suffered greatly being in this very, very restricted environment. But I think the hope is that once she becomes empress, uh, she will have more freedom, have more ability to influence. Uh, I think the whole society is looking uh, to her to, and hoping that she's able to be happier and fulfill this role. I met her a couple of times, but um, she was very, very invisible and depressed when I was there. It was really a, a sad thing, but I think that, um, that it'll be a really interesting thing to watch how that monarchy um, evolves in the future. They don't approach their job anything like the English, um, but they take it really, really seriously. And I think that the Japanese public um, has tremendous reverence for the imperial family. So I'm hoping that they can evolve. Um, I had many, many, the re one of the reasons it took three years for them to let the emperor abdicate was because since the crown prince, the new emperor, only has a daughter, they couldn't figure out who was going to be the crown prince. <laughs> so it took them like two years. So, I mean, it's hopeless. It really is hopeless. But, um, but anyway, they managed their way through it, and, um, and hopefully it will be you know, a real opportunity for, for Japan to um, celebrate what's great about it and to empower um, this empress and all Japanese women. So, so the good news is in our system, we elect presidents. We haven't had a woman president yet, uh, but there is at least the possibility of doing so even in 2020. Uh, so we have less rigidity in the system, even though there's still uh, plenty of it. Uh, Ambassador Kenny, thank you so much for spending thank time. Thank you. Thank you all.